we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon session of day four of MLSS 2020. I am Arash Mertu, and I will be hosting this session on optimal transport. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this session, Marco Couturi. Marco holds a PhD in applied mathematics obtained in 2005 at the Paris Institute School of Mines. He then worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Statistical Mathematics in Tokyo. After a period of lecturing in the Operations Research and Financial Engineering Department of Princeton University, he joined Kyoto University as an associate professor, where he became tenured in 2013. He joined the French National School of Statistics and Economics in 2016, where he still works part-time. Since 2018, he joined the Paris office of Google Brain as a research scientist. Marco's recent proposal to solve optimal transport using an entropic regularization has reignited interest in optimal transport and Wasserstein distances in the machine learning community. His work has recently focused on applying that loss function to problems involving probability distributions. For example, topic models, dictionary learning for text and images, parametric inference for generative models, regression with a Wasserstein loss, and probabilistic embeddings for words. The book he co-authored with Gabriel Pierre, titled Computational Optimal Transport, has become one of the main references for practical use of the theory of optimal transport. We are all looking forward to your lecture, Marco. The stage is yours, please. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'm super happy to, to give this lecture at the summer school in Tübingen. So wherever you are, I hope you're, you're doing great. Uh, and uh, please feel free to ask questions even after the lecture about this topic, about optimal transport. I'd be happy to, to respond. Uh, so it's a very exciting time for me to be, I mean, it's very exciting for me to be at the MLSS because I have a history of, uh, of organizing the MLSS uh, a few years ago. And it's, it's very nice to see that the, the community is still growing. And I would really like to thank the organizers for really taking the effort of organizing this one. So uh, I, we don't have that much time, so I'll just go directly to the point. Uh, uh, so this lecture will be about optimal transport. And uh, if you're not familiar with it, optimal transport is a field of, of mathematics that has been reaching the, the, the ML uh, spheres in recent years. And uh, I think there are, there are a few good reasons for that. So this, this two uh, lectures will be a dive into this. I will mostly focus on uh, the basics, that is computational aspects, statistical aspects, probabilistic aspects. And not so much on the applications because there's too many of them right now to, to, to be able to cover them in, 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 in two lectures. Um, so why why this? Why, why, why is this uh, now uh, something that people care? Well, it's something that, that is one of those fields in machine learning that seems to unite <clears throat> several areas of science. And uh, that includes economics. And uh, we have to give uh, credit to uh, people in economics for starting this field about uh, eight years ago. And it's also uh, something that people like in applied mathematics as well as pure mathematics. And right now, I think it's fair to say that it's a, a topic that is of interest for, for people in machine learning. So uh, we, we, we wrote a book about a year ago with Gabriel Perret that is available online and which summarizes a bit of the, the computational advances. So this is more for the, the methodological part. But uh, I'm also super excited to see in recent uh, years or maybe the year, year, previous year or so, work that is now spanning applications, for instance, to biology. Uh, so uh, it's, it's exciting for a mathematician to see titles such as this one, Optimal Transport Analysis of Single Cell Gene Expression uh, of a Paper Appearing Cell. There's, there's a few other ones that, that uh, you start seeing uh, this keyword of optimal transport popping up in areas that are not specifically about data science. So the, the, the theory, and this is probably why it's, it's also an exciting one, has a bit of everything. It's, uh, it's something that has uh, results on its own, that stand on its own, uh, that you can really attribute to optimal transport, but it also has, has branches in different areas. So that, uh, that is uh, uh, basically optimization, PDEs, probability theory, statistics, and you, seeing those ramifications from this unifying uh, point of view of uh, optimal transport is, is really interesting. And uh, the other, I think, interesting uh, aspect of optimal transport is that it builds on the very large supply of, of math, and uh, uh, math from, from the highest grade, if I can say. So the, the theory, the, the story of this, this field uh, is usually attributed to Monge. So Gaspard Monge, we'll get back to this 
was a, was a mathematician about a bit more than two centuries ago that had this intuition. And uh, we had to wait for quite a while, about 150 years, to see uh, those intuitions translate to actual numerical aspects and even applications. And so here I'm, 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 I'm uh, taking the picture of three uh, famous contributors to this theory. Uh, on the left, we have Leonid Katarovich and uh, then Kupmans on the right, who were both awarded the Nobel Prize Medal in 75 for their work. And arguably maybe George Stancic below, which should have been co-awarded maybe that medal as well for his work on linear programming. And then for a few years, this idea was essentially in the sphere of, uh, of mathematical programming and optimization, and slowly started drifting away towards PDs, partial differential equations, and more, I would say, more more pure mathematical aspects of, 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 of uh, uh, more pure pure aspects of mathematics. And so here's a list of contributors that you can see on the right, and uh, the maybe arguably the two most famous ones are now Filani and Figali who both received uh, Fields medals for their work. So when I say that this is a bit trending as a topic, uh, here I, I just uh, plotted a Google trend curve, which shows that, well, there seems to be some interest that is growing over time for the theory. Uh, I think a far more robust picture would be to account the number of papers at NeurIPS or ICML who mention optimal transport in a way uh, or another in their title. And uh, there's quite a few. So uh, just based on my own statistics, I think there were about at least 100 submissions last year that mentioned Wasserstein, Optimal Transport, Syncorn, or any variant of that in the title. And I guess there's a lot more papers that use them uh, inside. So if I have to just summarize Optimal Transport Theory uh, in, in one slide, it would be just saying that it is the natural geometry for probability measures. And so natural here doesn't mean much, uh, arguably. Uh, but essentially the idea is optimal transport is a very physical uh, point of view on how you expect two probability distributions to relate to each other. It's as if, for instance, you were taking a snapshot of something at some point, mass, gases, liquids, whatever, and you took this, another picture at a different point in time and then optimal transport helps you solve the riddle of what happened in between. Who is related to whom? Uh, who might be the best candidate to have morphed into this person or this cell or this word, or et cetera. And so here is a list of such uh, of cases where you have this, this, uh, this problem where you are given stuff in some configuration at some point, similar stuff in another, in another configuration at a different point, and then you want to, to, to draw links between my, what might have happened in between. And so here I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a few examples. So stuff that is distributed to some, according to some distribution is the definition of a, a probability density. So in statistical models, of course, it makes a lot of sense to use optimal transport as a way to, to compare two distributions. Uh, maybe perhaps more surprisingly, and I, I hope I can talk a bit about this in the end. Uh, basically, when you see a population of cells in some state, and maybe later you see them in a different state, well, optimal transport helps you solve this, this problem of basically what, which cell became what kind of cell next. And so we, we see increasing the applications to genomics. Uh, when you look at, for instance, text uh, as bag of words, of course, you're again in this setup where you have masks that is allocated to some words and you want to be able to, to say basically how different this point cloud is from this one. In brain activation, you might think, for instance, those are two activations from two different people in the two different stimulus, for instance, and you want to quantify how similar they are, and you want to see those activations as, as you know, mass, something that, that lights up, and you want to guess how you could go from this configuration here to this configuration. And it's also been a, an important topic in, 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 a, in machine learning related to generative models. So you, you might have heard about Wasserstein GANs and optimal transport GANs, et cetera. And in that case, the optimal transport also helps solve the problem. And uh, in a maybe more intuitive and easier way, I mean, easier to, 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 to picture a way, uh, you can also compare color histograms with, opti with optimal transport. There is an important thing, though, that underlies all those comparisons is the idea that you want to be able to quantify how costly it is 
to shift mass from one observation to another. So by this, I mean that if you're going to compare two point clouds of words, two word clouds, then uh, you will need to, in the context of optimal transport, be able to quantify how each of those two elements in the, in the supports of the two measures is different. So to, to compare two probability distribution, two, point, two word clouds using optimal transport, you must be able to compare two words, two instances. So in other words, if you have a way to compare two observations, optimal transport gives you the way to compare two distributions on those, on those observations. So in the case of the brain activation, it's also the same thing. If you have a way to say that this area of the brain is very far or not so far from this one, then you can use optimal transport. So this is, this is really important. And so this was a, another illustration here for the generative model case. Here, in, indeed, when you're going to use generative models, which try to parameterize a, a probability distribution as a manifold, the important thing would be to uh, quantify how different your true data from your, your manifold, your generated uh, manifold is. So what I will be addressing in these lectures is essentially three things. I don't think I will have the time to go to selected applications, but I've, I've added them to the slides so that you can have a look uh, for yourselves. So there's basically three, three things I really want to focus on those lectures, and they are uh, an intuitive introduction to what optimal transport is. And as I said earlier, there's different, if you ask different mathematicians what their way of uh, imagining or, or uh, seeing what optimal transport does, it's going to be different. Some people will insist on, 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 on a map. Some people will insist on a transportation plan and a matrix. Some people will have a more dynamic point of view. And so I will try to briefly uh, describe those. Uh, now, because this is a machine learning summer school, we know that at some point we need to compute things. And I will very briefly describe how you can actually compute optimal transport uh, if you follow to the letter the definitions that were proposed uh, a few centuries ago. However, as you, you all know, it's very common that in machine learning, we need to cut corners somewhat to, to make things that are scalable. And I will argue in this lecture that actually it's not only important from a computational point of view so that we can actually scale up, but it's also important from a statistical point of view. And, uh, and then I think I will be done for this and, and, and I will put the slides for the rest. So let me just switch I mean, to, to, to the introduction about optimal transport. In this section, I will provide two examples, which I think are intuitive about uh, how you can imagine optimal transport as a tool and what it does, what it tries to compute, what it tries to solve. And those, it's, it's typical in the literature to split two problems, to present two problems. And one is called the Morse problem, and the other is called the Kantorovich problem. And uh, you will see that they're related, but they're not completely the same. So it's, it's worth actually uh, keeping track of how different they are. And then I would try to explain essentially what, once those problems are posed, what, what we can gain from them. Um, optimal transport is in itself an optimization problem, but uh, just solving it is not interesting. We can use it. We can use the, the, the solution to that optimal transport problem or even the arg, the arg mean, the, 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 the value or the solution itself. So uh, the story starts with uh, uh, Gaspard Monge in, uh, in 1781. So Gaspard Monge was a, was a, is a famous mathematician here in France. And he has contributed to several aspects. He has had an impact on society, creating uh, several universities here. And you can easily see this if you if you come to Paris, because you will notice that there is a Place Monge uh, uh, metro station with a Place uh, on top of it. Uh, there is a Rue Monge. There are several places that that remind us of his of his impact and his legacy on on, on French mathematics. And um, what Monge proposed was in 1781. He, he actually posed the problem. He didn't solve it. He actually opened up an area by just asking questions. And he said, well, this is in French, but if, if you were to try to, to, to read it or, or translate it, basically he says, when one has to bring Earth from one place to another, then you have to ask yourself the questions of how to do it, right? Imagine you have a pile of sand that's standing somewhere. So here I'm representing it as a, as a measure mu on the real line. And uh, I have a hole on the ground, which is of the same volume. And so Morge asks simply, what would be an efficient way 
to move all of that mass, that matter, where it is now, so that it reaches a different configuration, which is the one that I want. And here it's 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 simple. The the, the goal is just simply to uh, move all of the red sand and and to cover the the hole on the right hand side. Now, uh, of course, in the twenty first century, if you ask yourself to to a child, uh, if you ask if you ask this question to a child or any person, then there's no real incentive to optimize anything. You would just simply take a machine and just push the entire mass that that that, that you've been given towards where, wherever you need to 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 to, to put it. Uh, what you have to think is that in 1781, such machines did not exist. And so we have to think a bit more uh, carefully about actually how we would move mass around. And what Wonge uh, said is, well, imagine that you have a, a worker which will be equipped with a shovel. The, sho the worker will uh, be uh, asked to pick up uh, sand or earth at some point. And this will be indexed by the location on the on the real line x, and the worker will find at that location an amount of mass, an infinitesimal amount of mass, which will be mu x, the density at, at that point. And now, the, what the worker needs to, or you should instruct the worker to do, is where should the worker drop that uh, that mass? And so, here you can see this. You can basically define this as a function. We are going to provide for every location x where there is mass a uh, target y, which will be equal to t of x. And the thing that you would want to do is just simply move that mass from x to t of x, t of y. And uh, in doing so, it's reasonable to assume that the cost somewhat will be related to the distance that the worker will need to. Uh, walk to carry the mass from x to t of x. Now, uh, there is an important part in, in this in this displacement, which is that not only did the work the worker need to walk walk from x to t of x, but the worker also had to carry an amount of mass which was mu of x. So it's uh, what what Moore says is that a reasonable quantification of how uh, how costly this is should be the mass times the distance. Uh, now, this is just a proposal, and uh, if you look at uh, the literature in optimal transport recently, uh, there are far more general uh, formulations of this. The cost may not be related, for instance, to being just a distance. It may be something a bit more general. Uh, it may be the distance to a square also, which makes computations easier. Uh, so that there's a lot of variations, of course. But this was the first uh, instance of an optimal transport problem. Now, uh, when Monge defines this problem, uh, there is something that here he hasn't said yet, and which is arguably the most important thing, is that it's not just a matter of defining a function that, uh, that that is going to take whatever x and bring it to whatever y. What you need to do is, is uh, uh, guarantee that this function solves the mass conservation problem. So by this, I mean that in the end, if I propose a function t, okay, so remember this is a function from r to r, what it does is that it needs to fill up infinitesimal holes on the right-hand side, or actually larger holes. So imagine that I have a segment B that is on the right. Uh, on the right, in that segment, I can imagine what was the mass from the red measure that came through that segment, and if you if you define T. So by this I mean that you can define the inverse in terms of sets of B under the action of this uh, map t. And that's just simply the all of the x's on the real line, such that t of x was landing into that segment b. So suppose that inverse set here is t is, uh, is composed of three segments, a1, a2, and a3. And what we mean by conservation of mass is essentially the following. It's that the mass, the amount of sand that was available in segments a1, a2, and a3, is equal to the amount of sand that you need to fill up in uh, in segment B. So, in other words, the mass or the measure of A1, A2, and A3, so those are basically quantities uh, defined as amount of uh, I mean, uh, volume or a mass or whatever, must be equal to that of the target measure at that segment B. And in uh, in mathematical terms, 
this needs to be observed for every segment. And when you have this defined for every segment, it basically means that you want that the measure for every set here, here I've just shown segments, but that would be actually for every set. The measure for every set of uh, nu of b must be equal to the measure of the input uh, measure of t minus one of b. And in, in, um, in mathematical notations, it's easy to write this as the push forward of uh, mu uh, under the action of t is equal to nu. Okay, so it's as if you were applying, so t is a map from r to r, and you're applying to each element in the support of mu this map t, t of x going to some y. And if you do this infinitesimally, uh, bit of sand by bit of sand, then you, you get in the end the measure mu on the right hand side. And what Monge asked is okay, if this is already quite challenging to, to, to figure out. How could I do this? But uh, uh, what Monge asks is a bit more than that. He says, among all those functions that allow me to move the mass from mu to nu, which one minimizes the total cost? And here again, the assumption of Monge is to say that the total cost is just a sum of all those uh, infinitesimal displacements. So this is the Monge problem. Uh, it's, it's nicely defined. It's, not, not, uh, it's quite intuitive. But there is one thing that should alarm you a bit if you, if you uh, know based about optimization is that this constraint is actually a very nasty constraint. And it's easy to show that this is not even a, it's not a convex constraint. That is, if you have a function t1 that satisfies this and another function t2 that satisfies this, uh, the average of those two functions will not satisfy this in general. So uh, it's a conceptually simple uh, problem, but actually uh, in terms of optimization, it's quite nasty. Now, if there's no other question, um, if there's no question, sorry, uh, I will now move to uh, the second formulation of optimal transport, which is associated with, with Kantorovich, although arguably uh, several people could, could, uh, could claim the, uh, part of that idea. Specifically, uh, a mathematician from the Soviet Union, uh, Tolstoy in the 30s. Katovich also was, was working in the Soviet Union. And Hitchcock in the US, who proposed in the for, uh, very early 40s uh, exactly the same problem. So to, um, I will stick to Katovich to, to present the formulation that bears his name now. And so I'm going to imagine that we are, this is uh, World War II in 1942. And this is the, the, the Eastern Front. And uh, we're going to suppose we have a, a front line here, which is this, this, this blue drawing. And that uh, we have a problem. I mean, we, we, we are a red army general. And we need to move troops uh, so that they are now in a location. They are in barracks. And we want them to move to a given uh, uh, front line, a given place in the front line. So here, what I'm assuming is that, oops, is there a, I think my keynote crashed. So let me just relaunch it. Sorry for the crash. I need to just start again. Is there any question? Otherwise, I can maybe. Uh, not so far. Okay, great. Uh, I, I'm just, uh, I think it should be fine. So let me just, uh, I guess I need to specify again the application. Okay, great. Sorry for this. Yes. Yes, all good. Uh, yeah, we just don't see you, so it's nice if you also. Ah, okay, 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 sure, 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 sure. I think yeah. this should be all good. Okay. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, can you see the, the keynote? Yes. Okay, great. So, as I was just explaining, uh, we we are in this in, the, in this case where we we have soldiers that are, are ah, it crashed again. It doesn't like this animation. It seems. Uh, let me just try to. Maybe I will skip to the next slide. Maybe that would help. You could also export it to PDF and then PDF, yeah. No, no, but I think I think it should be fine. It's just that 
Uh, maybe it didn't like this, this animation at all. Uh, okay, so we're up and running again, and then but every time I, okay, I need to put my video again. Okay, so hopefully this works. Right? Yes, so far. Okay. Uh, so imagine that you have you have uh, you have those soldiers that are, are laying uh, that are resting now in the barracks on, on the right hand side, and you want them to go actually to the front line. And if you look at the the amount here, we have sixty, let's say sixty thousand, sixty thousand soldiers, ninety. Ah, oh, I don't know what's going on. I'm sorry for this. Maybe exporting the PDF. Uh, yes, but okay. I will try to maybe during the break. Um, we have thirty minutes break yes. between your lecture and the next session, so you can take your time. Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. Let me just try to see. Okay, I can try to do this with, with um, I can try to do this with PDF. Mm -hmm. Anand, is there anything uh, fun to talk about? <laughs> Anyone from the Apple? Uh, no chat. I think the participants are not interesting, interested in questions also. What the fun can we talk about? Well, I don't know, man. <laughs> OK, let me just. Uh, you like optimal transport, right? I mean, just tell us why you like it so much. <laughs> well, I think Marco is the better person to tell, right? No, Marco is expert. working on this slice thing, and you can. Okay, I think. So somebody, somebody asked, why is optimal transport getting popular now? I think one reason is Marco. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you see the screen now or not? Yes, yes I can see the screen. Okay, so now we're we're back to just PDF, so no animations. Great. Oh, this, this is a long PDF, 348 pages. Nice. Yeah, because when you, when you use animation, it takes some time. Okay, good. So it will kill a bit of the, the charm of all this, but no, no problem. Let's, let's just yes, this. before you uh, start again, somebody asked, like, why is optimal transport getting popular now? And uh, does it regard like optimization getting better or something else? So. Uh, yeah, of course, of course. So, so it's clearly the, 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 the what, what you just suggested. I mean, it, it's. Uh, I think. I think there's a few things. One, one of them is, of course, solvers that scale better, uh, and I think one of one of the reasons is uh, that we have a better understanding also of the fact that, and I will get back to this later in the talk. That uh, if you want to solve optimal transport the way it was designed by mathematicians uh, mm -hmm. a century ago. And then you run, you run into a few issues and actually regularizing and what we as ma uh, machine learners think is a bit of a dirty business of you know adding regularization here and there is actually very beneficial also from from a, from a statistical viewpoint so it's hacking a bit your way around is actually very good even in theory and so this is this is why it's uh, because of those hacks things scale better and on the other hand the, the theory still has a lot of charm I would say to, to and a lot of interest to explain things that are complicated. Okay, so uh, so what I was saying is, uh, oh, yeah, good. So we have those those barracks. We have those people that we want to move around. And uh, if you had to actually do this in a naive way, if you wanted to bring those red soldiers to the blue front lines, uh, a very simple way to do this. Is essentially to split uh, the task, and if you need, for instance, 120 and 90 and 90,000 soldiers in each of those three front lines, it means that you have a proportion of for every four soldiers that I want in the left, I would want to put uh, three here and three here. And uh, 
if you think about the solution, it's, it's, it works. And there's something else about it, which is that it doesn't even look at the problem's geometry. It just says, if you have a measure here and you have another measure there, just basically split everything according, whatever mass you have here, you split it according to this measure and then and then do things proportionally. And so it's it's a, this this actually simple idea is we will see later is behind the idea of uh, maximum mean discrepancy or energy distances that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, however, the problem is that this incurs a lot of movement of troops. Basically, you keep you're, you're basically moving around uh, all of all of the all of the troops in all directions, and so. Uh, this doesn't is not really uh, is, is an answer that doesn't take into account the geometry of the problem, and so the idea of optimal transfer and Kantorovich's idea was to look for a better way to move around the mass, and the way uh, Kantorovich uh, basically poses the problem is Kantorovich splits it as two things: one is going to be geometry, and the other is going to be just simply uh, the masses that that, that are there. So there, on the one hand, we are going to see that the problem involves moving 60, 90, and 150,000 uh, soldiers, and 120, 90, and 90. And the only thing that we're going to keep about this map is just simply a, a matrix of distances. And that matrix is going to be simply what is the distance between each of the source points, the red source points, and the blue target points. And uh, what Kantovich now asks is simply, if you're a general in the Red Army, the only thing you want to know is, of those 60,000 soldiers, how many people you want to send to each of those three points in the front line? So on the right, left-hand side, we call this a transportation matrix. It's a set of instructions. And on the right-hand side, uh, hand side, this is the distance matrix, which is essentially the geometry of your problem. Now, those three things, so the first marginal, the second marginal, and the, the distance matrix is, is, is just, those are the ingredients, the only ingredients you need. And uh, what, what Kantorovich uh, asked to do is basically fill up those, the, the transportation matrix with values that had to satisfy just a very simple constraint, which is this mass conservation constraint. And so let me recap. The Red Army General needs to fill in those values. And there's one thing he, should be careful about is that every uh, line here sums to what uh, is given and every column sums to what is needed. So in other words, if I just uh, start popping in variable names instead of, instead of actual values, the only thing that we want is that those three variables here be equal when you sum them to the marginal here. And that those three columns, uh, those three value, uh, values here in, in, in a column be equal to the value that, 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 that is in the bottom. So it's, it, this is just a mass conservation constraint. And it means that you are optimizing under those constraints. When you're going to allocate mass moving around, you always need to, to satisfy this. And then the other thing that Katorovich says, and Kubmans and, and, and Hitchcock have said as well, is we are going to score that proposal of yours of moving mass around by looking at the total sum of costs that it induces. And here the sum, the cost would just be the sum of whatever you transport from I to J multiplied by the distance between I and J. So here you should clearly see the, the analogy with the Morse uh, problem. So the problem of, 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 of Katorovich is basically minimizing over all valid transportation matrices this cost. Now, in this case, this might look this. This is what the solution might look like. The solution might be, for instance, splitting only that group into two, only that group into two like this, and moving around the uh, the soldiers accordingly. So here, for instance, this means that 30 of those soldiers should go here, and uh, 30 of the soldiers should go here. The 90 soldiers that were here went here, and they sum to 120, and here you have 90 and 90. So Kantorovich formulation is is very is di very different from Moore's point of view because here, we, as you've seen, we haven't considered functions. We're only trying to solve this in a discrete world. So this is why uh, there is a bit of a divide in the community. Whenever you are only considering continuous objects such as densities, 
on the on right hand side. So you can see that there is a, a link between those two interpretations. Whereas if you are dealing with discrete measures, and this is what most of us people in machine learning have to deal with most of the time, then you're going to think more about the counter-average problems. And there are some links between the two, and I will go back to that later. Let me now close a bit this uh, intro by adding yet another uh, viewpoint on this. So it's not going to be about moving Earth. It's not going to be about uh, moving soldiers uh, and allocating them. It's going to be about uh, more physical phenomena. And so this is an example that, that uh, Alessio Figali provided. Imagine that you're looking at a cloud right now, and you take a picture of a cloud. A cloud is a zillion particles, but let's, let's just imagine it's maybe 1,000 of them. And so the cloud is moving in space and in time, right? Um, you take a snapshot at some point of those 1,000 particles. You can't really recognize one from the other, right? It's very hard to recognize a particle cloud from another. But here what you are looking at is a population and what the population looks like. Five seconds later, you're taking again the picture of the same cloud. So somewhat you know that all of the particles that were here are now there. But because you can't identify each of the particles individually, the only thing you can actually do is look at a bunch of things here and a bunch of things there. And you don't have access to actually trying to guess who went where. And what optimal transport provides you is somewhat solves the riddle of what happened in between, who went where. And the way it does it is by solving an optimal transport problem. It basically says, I will try to, I mean, I will, I will make the hypothesis that nature moves in an optimal way. So if this bunch of particles was taking a bit later in this configuration, then it means that some of the particles had to move, but I'm going to assume that they did it in a way that is, that is not so costly. Meaning this particle here didn't go there, for instance. And so this is the, the point of view. And this is a point of view that you can actually apply to several problems. And one of them is, 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 is biology. And so some of the papers that I cited earlier build on this intuition. Imagine that you have a Petri dish right now and you're faced with a bunch of cells here. And maybe six hours later, you look at other cells. And of course, because cells evolve, they maybe, uh, they will grow differently. They will have different features. Maybe their gene expression profile will be different uh, over time. So the way they change is, is not, is not uh, precisely described here. But you can see that the cell basically uh, has different characteristics over time. So you're looking at this population. And you're looking at it six hours later. And you expect that somewhat this thing here is the origin of this. And those things here, each of those here, somewhat evolved to become one of those on the right hand side. And so in biology, the way we do this is essentially coming up with feature descriptors for each of the cells in some space. And so this is a bit like the point, the, 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 the cloud, the, 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 um, the cloud of, uh, that, I, that I showed earlier, instead, except that instead of being in three dimensions, it would be in dimension, let's say, 5,000 for 5,000 descriptors. And you look at what happened, and you look at those feature descriptors six hours later. And now you're going to say, well, those points somewhat had to move to get to where they are right now. There's no way I can actually pin exactly one and see what it became because I'm looking at a population. I'm not isolating a cell on its own. But what I can do is basically use optimal transport. So I'm going to put them in the same space and now look at what is the least costly way to move things. So of course, you can go back to the analogy between soldiers. This might be soldier barracks and front lines. This might be Earth that was given in some configuration and you want to be in another configuration. But the idea is basically you had to move Things happened, and you want to guess what happened using optimal transport. And so once you have the optimal transport, essentially what you you have is a way to know that this cell is probably the one that is responsible for this one here later. So the Morse problem, what it does is it goes beyond just simply simple one-to-one uh, -one allocations. It will, it will actually try to do something a bit more ambitious, which is to reconstruct an entire function. If you, if you, if you take a step back, Morse problem was to construct a function, a mapping, whereas Katorovich problem was just to come up with a matrix. And so one is, of course, much easier to compute than the other. But still, I mean, the, the, the links are, are there. So before maybe I go to the, the, the math, is there any question or? Yes. 
so so uh, lucas said i seem to remember that the refusion distance approximates the wasserstein distance is that correct and if so is there an analytic analytical link as well can you say the, the beginning again just the beginning so uh, he, he said i seem to remember that the diffusion distance approximate the wasserstein distance is that correct and if so is there an analytical link as well so there are links between diffusions and wasserstein distances but it's a bit more complicated than that. i mean i i would i wanted to see exactly what you call a diffusion distance uh, the other question about emmanuel do we know whether this assumption that nature moves particle in the in the least costly way holds <laughs> well it's just a principle of minimum you know energy so uh, it's it's uh, it's a fair point um i don't have right now examples where people actually are able to look at who is wearing where exactly and and comparing it to what the optimal transport solution would would tell you so it it is a prior it's it's something that is a strong prior uh mm -hmm. and and the um, I mean, the, the question that you ask is somewhat raises questions in terms of inverse problems, for instance. Yeah. Uh, if you actually observe some yeah. movements and and you know who is going where, could you describe this as an optimal transport solution of some given cost, for instance? So this this, uh, yeah. this starts raising uh, more complicated and interesting problems. Okay. There are two more questions. First is, could you please provide some example of optimal transport in economics where is, where it was used first? Uh, so a lot of people started using optimal transport actually in, uh, in actual transportation. <laughs> if you look at the papers in the 50s and 60s, a uh, big chunk of the literature is about transportation. So it's moving actual people. You know, they might be going from their house to their workplace and uh, you have populations. And then you start thinking, okay, if people are really clever all together, they should be moving around the mass uh, themselves optimally. Another and if we go a bit be before that, in the 30s, the, the Tolstoy reference I, uh, I was mentioning is actually about the, the, the railroad system of the Soviet Union. So we had, uh, I mean, there, there were resources that were in some configurations. They had to be translocated to another configuration. And so as, as early as the 30s, uh, uh, this was the problem. And uh, another interesting anecdote is that in the 50s, one of the applications of of uh, optimal transport was exactly to find out, compute what would be the optimal transport of the Soviet Union network to actually bomb it in the areas where it would hurt the most. <laughs> so this was a Navy paper in the 50s that, that, that was actually saying, okay, think if, if, if people move things optimally, where should I, what, what is the link, what is the railroad that I should try to bomb? So that actually this, this makes uh, induces the, the maximal disruption. Okay. Well, there's one more question. We can also keep it for round table, depending on you, Marco. Okay. okay. I mean, we, we, we can, let's continue and then we can. We can. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, good. So, uh, so that, let's, let's be a bit more precise in terms of mathematics. Uh, so we, we have a, a generic space, a measurable space, a cost. Two probability measures supported on that space. And the most problem in 81, 1781 was basically finding a map from omega to omega that minimizes uh, the, the total cost. So this is the integration uh, uh, against the map. This is the input measure mu of the cost of going from x to t of x. Okay, And then mu, the second measure, is basically contained only here. It's the constraint. Okay, the constraint is that when you are going to use that map, you're going to push it as such that you're going to reconstruct this second uh, distribution here. So interestingly, we had to wait for two centuries to have an important uh, result here. So this is 1781 and this is 1987. And the, 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 the most problem was really a headache for, for mathematicians for, for, for a long time because of the reasons that I just mentioned. Basically, the, co the constraint is so nasty that uh, it's actually difficult to make anything out of it. And uh, to add to this difficulty, it turns out that Morse chose the hardest type of cost. So Morse, Morse cost was basically usually the distance. And it turns out that it's actually the one that is mathematically the most challenging. And so uh, what, what Brunier's breakthrough was, and uh, this is a beautiful theor the th uh, theorem, 
It's a very deep one. And it's deep because it relates uh, two things that didn't seem to be that <laughs> related. And it's optimal transfer on the one hand and convexity, just usual convexity on the other hand. So here is the theorem. Let's just parse it. If omega is RD and the cost is a square degree in distance, so so far this is 90% of what machine learning deals with, uh, then if the measures are well behaved, so let's just say that here they're absolutely continuous, then the optimal transport, the thing that minimizes the, 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 this problem here, must be of the form that it is the gradient of a convex function. So by this, I mean the following. Remember that a, well, a convex function on RD is just uh, values from RD to R. And the gradient of this of a function u is going to be a function that is valued from Rd to Rd. Okay. So if if omega here is Rd, what, what we're looking for is something that goes from Rd to Rd. Okay, just moves something in that space. And so a convex function, the, the so the gradient of a function, a real valued function, is actually such a fits the build. Now, what is amazing is that the optimal transform, no matter what mu and u look like, as long as they're continuous. And well behaved, the optimal transport, the thing that is the best way for you to move from this distribution to this distribution, will necessarily be the gradient of a convex function. And the theorem is a bit, even uh, a bit deeper. It basically says whenever you have a function u that is convex, the gradient of u will be the optimal transport Mohr map between any measure mu and the push forward of that measure under this gradient of u. So to, to put things differently, you take a measure, you take any convex function, you compute the gradient, okay? So the a convex function is real valued, the gradient is the same function, but basically valued in vectors. You apply this gradient to uh, the measure mu as a, as a push forward, and then you will get a different measure, and you know that you cannot do better actually to go from that input measure to the output measure that you just produced by then taking the, the, the transport, which is the gradient of u. So you, you, I mean, maybe it takes a little time to let that sink in, but basically it says that whenever you're applying to a measure, a push forward, which is the gradient of a convex function, then you're doing things the way they should be. That is the way they are optimal. So, this result is, is is fundamental, and what is interesting is that let's say that up to 2015, 16, this was a bit too mathematical for to be of interest for um, for machine learning uh, the machine learning community, but this is changing a little bit. So it turns out that this result is finding applications in in, in machine learning right now. Now, the the reason why if you start diving into the optimal transport literature you will see PDEs popping up, is essentially that this result provides a PDE approach to computing optimal transport. I won't go too much into the details, but if you have this result, okay, that uh, omega is equal to Rd, the cost is square Euclidean, and you have two densities that are well-behaved. Well, the fact that a function t pushes forward and measure mu to nu is equivalent, this is a change of variables formula, to saying that the density of x is equal to the density of the, uh, the, the the second measure q at t of x times the determinant of the Jacobian of x. So I think those of you that are familiar with normalizing flows are, 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 are have seen this formula several times, but this is just the, the, the change of variables formula. So let me now replace this function t by the gradient of a function u, uh, which is convex, because I know that thanks to Brownian theorem, there must be if I'm talking about optimal transport, there must be a function u or here, I just wrote f, sorry, a function f such that t is the gradient of f. And so if you just replace t here by gradient of f, you would have q of the gradient of f. And if you replace the determinant of the Jacobian, it's basically the Hessian, which is here a positive definite of that function f. And so here, this is this is, this PD is, is called the mont jean equation. So you can solve optimal transport using the mont jean equation. Which is a famous PD. But uh, one of the reasons why this is, is useful from a data science perspective, but still not that easy to manipulate, is that there are lots of de degeneracies. 
the first thing I, I should really clarify is that in most cases, actually, when you're dealing with uh, discrete measures, the, 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 the Morse problem is not well defined. It's actually very intuitive to, to see why. Imagine that my first measure is a Dirac mass, just one point here. And I'm trying to go from one Dirac mass to this regular uh, density here. Well, you can, you can imagine that if you're a Morse and you're trying to give the instruction to a worker to move this here towards somewhere here and you want to recover this, it's not going to be possible. Because if you give me a Dirac in the input, the only thing I can do with Morse is just move that Dirac somewhere else. And so there's no way I would be able to actually uh, uh, diffuse the mass. And so this is why Katorovich uh, formulation, the one of, again that I go back is uh, with, the, with the barracks and everything, kicks it. This is why Katrovich is basically a generalization or re relaxation of, of, of Moore's problem. The point of view of uh, Katrovich is to say that rather than looking for a map that goes from omega to omega, we're going to switch perspectives and look for couplings. And so what is a coupling? Well, first you could see a coupling as something that is the result of a lot of conditional densities. And by conditional densities, I mean, Rather than assuming that x will be transported to some point t of x and only one t of x, we are going to say that the mass, whatever mass there was at x, I'm allowed to distribute it according to some probability distribution. And now if I take the collection of all those probability distributions, I just get a coupling. And a coupling in this case would be something, would be a joint probability distribution of the space omega times omega that would be such that it has the right marginal. It would be such that the, the, the measure of the coupling here at, at any set A times omega would be equal to the marginal, the first marginal at A, mu of A. And the measure here of omega times B is going to be a mu of B. So let me just give a more concrete illustration. If omega is the real line, then the only thing I want is that if I have a measure mu on the left and the measure nu on the right, a coupling is going to be a density on the product space, R2, such that if I push all of the mass in this direction, I recover mu. And if I push all the mass in this direction, I recover mu. And what is nice about couplings is that they're always defined. No matter what measures you give me, mu and u, there will always be a coupling. So here, for instance, there's two of them that I just can just plot. But even if I only had one Dirac here, and let's say two Dirac's there, I could still take the product of those two uh, measures, even if they are Dirac, that still gives me a coupling that is valid. So to summarize, the two ways to define optimal transport that, that you will see in the literature, it's either you're a Morse person and uh, you directly consider this nasty, uh, difficult to handle, push forward constraint, but then you have a simple and very intuitive uh, integration here, which is, Whenever I take a mass from mu, I bring it to t uh, x, I bring it to t of x, and I look at the cost. And so optimizing over space of function is actually fun. It's interesting. So this is why it's a nice, uh, interesting uh, problem. But it's very hard to actually solve in practice. So you will need to cook something to get rid of somewhat this, this, this constraint. The other one which is the Kantorovich problem. And this is a linear program, this, which is why we're in much safer and much easier world. It's going to be, well, whenever there are two measures mu and u, there are going to be couplings that satisfy that they have the marginals mu and u. Among all of those, and I know that there's at least one that exists, which is just the product of the two marginals, find the one that has the smallest uh, cost. And here the cost is just a double integration. So in terms of uh, optimization problem, this is just a linear problem, okay? Now, the reason why people attribute a lot to Kantorovich in this field is that he was also the first one to highlight duality. So what is duality? Well, it's essentially the idea that this optimization problem can be cast in a different way. Instead of casting it as into, uh, taking the, a coupling that has the smallest cost, average cost, Kantorovich proposed an alternative formulation, which is we are going to look for two functions. You can call them test functions, phi and psi, that you're going to integrate over phi over mu and integrate over nu. 
But there will be a catch here, which we, will be that they need to satisfy some constraint, which is that phi of x or psi of y for every pair x, y must be smaller than the cost between x and y. So I will actually show how you can derive this. And uh, it takes a bit of, uh, it, this is just simple duality, but I think it's, it's, it's nice to see how it works for, for, for transport. But maybe, maybe we mention a break or how would you want to do this? Yes, maybe we can have a few minutes of break. Yeah. Would you like to take some questions? Yeah, sure. Um, so Rinak Sharma has asked whether we can express the KL divergence as the cost of the solution of an optimal transport problem. To my knowledge, no. Because the, I mean, so the KL divergence is, a, is an F divergence and it essentially operates by uh, integrating uh, over two densities and looking at the difference between, let's say if I have a mu and mu, it would basically be a long integration of how mu of x is different from mu of x. And in that case, it means that you're looking just at each of the x's as if they were in complete isolation, and you compare every time mu of x and mu of x. Uh, there is one case where you can cast um, a divergence that is a total variation as an optimal transport problem. As a, and in that case, it's a, it's a very naive cost, which is just a, a zero one cost. But otherwise, I, I, for KL divergence, no. Yes. So the next question is, um, since the convex U is not necessarily C1 is smooth, is your gradient yes. map uh, is your gradient map set value? For example, is it subgradients? Yeah. So this is an excellent question. Um, so uh, this is basically what 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 is what, what regularity theory is about, and this is the 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 um, the work of this points to work of Caffarelli and Figali. Basically, their question was uh, upon which conditions on the input and output measures can I guarantee that the optimal transport will be regular, be Lipschitz basically. And so, in, in terms of uh, Lipschitzness of the map, this is the same as saying that, for instance, the, the, the convex function is smooth. And so there are some conditions for which you can prove that the, the, the transport is going to be Lipschitz. Uh, and there are a lot of counterexamples where it's not. And indeed, the, 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 the part where I mentioned the, the gradient uh, and the Mont links to Mont pair equation assumes a lot of regularity. So there are indeed a few, a few issues there. Yes. So uh, next question is from Chu Feng. Uh, feel free to ask your question, Jufe. Um, uh, okay, thanks. Uh, my question is, what is the difference between uh, what we call linear programming and the uh, optimal transport method? Uh, so uh, clearly, um, uh, uh, linear programming subsumes uh, optimal transport, the classic optimal transport uh, world. Uh, there is a very strong link between the two. If you look even historically, the reason why Danzig got interested in solving uh, linear programs in general is uh, because of the optimal transport problem. And uh, the optimal transport problem is also shown to be equivalent to a large class of linear programming problems, which are network flows. So you can always rewrite a network flow problem as a transport problem. Uh, now, there are lots of... Uh, formulations now, more general formulations of optimal transport uh, problems that are no longer linear. And there are lots of linear problems that are not optimal transport problems. So they, they, they have a big intersection, uh, but they, they're not uh, completely one part of the other. Yes. So maybe we okay, can thank you. Uh, and keep the rest of the questions for the round table. Okay. So let's, let's dive into duality. Uh, so uh, the first thing uh, I, I, I want to ask is a small riddle. Imagine that you have two functions phi and psi that go from omega to r, and you have a coupling. So remember, a coupling is something that, uh, so maybe I'm sorry, I, I, there was some notation that I wanted to go through. Uh, for two functions phi and psi, I am going to write phi plus o plus uh, psi as something that takes a pair of values x and y and outputs uh, the sum of phi of x plus psi of y. So it's a bit like a tensor sum of two functions. So 
out of two uh, functions values on, R, on omega, uh, sorry, uh, taking values in omega, you output a, a function that uh, takes values in omega times omega. So this makes notations a bit a bit easier. So phi plus psi is this. So imagine that you have two functions and I'm integrating phi against mu, psi against mu, and then subtracting to this, uh, the integration of my function phi plus psi here, this is a, something that takes pairs as inputs, dp. And this, remember, is a coupling, so it also uh, locates mass on pairs. So the question is, what is this? What, 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 what is this? What, what's, what's the value of this? And actually, it's very simple to see that, I mean, I could leave you for a few minutes to think about it. It's a, a simple exercise, that this is equal to zero. Why is that? Well, remember that this here is just like saying phi of x plus psi of y, pxy. And so if this only depends on the x and this only depends on psi, then we can split it and put it here on the left and on the right. And so here we are integrating only phi of x against dpxy, and here only psi of y against dpxy. Here, obviously, the integration with respect to y doesn't really change much anything. And the same thing applies here with x. And so what happens is that if we integrate against y, we can remove this, this the integral because this is a probability measure. And we are basically left with just whatever is the, the integral, the marginal of p against x. And this is exactly by definition of the, the fact that the coupling belongs to this set, the integration against the mu and the integration against the mu. So basically, this is equal to 0. Okay. If I just integrate against this marginal and this marginal and against the coupling, because this has this marginal and this marginal, it works. And remember, this is only due to the fact that phi plus psi is separable. Now, uh, this provides a nice way to quantify whether a, a, a certain coupling has the right marginals. So suppose now that I have any probability measure that is positive on omega squared. Well, if I just introduce uh, this, this, this quantity here, so now I'm no longer assuming P is in the right set of, uh, of marginally constrained uh, couplings. It's just any measure. If I just write down this, well, I get definitely this thing here. I get the integral against phi of the difference between the marginal of P in the first measure and mu and the difference between the marginal of p in the second measure and u. And in general, this will be not zero. It's very likely that this is not going to be zero. And this will be zero here and here only if I get this satisfied, which means that I can define an indicator function for the space of couplings that, I, that is of interest to me. I'm going to say, <clears throat> whenever I, we have a p, take the supremum of again, against phi and psi of this difference. And as I said earlier, in general, if this belongs to, if this doesn't belong to mu and u, then the supremum of this will be whatever I want, it will be as large as I want, it will be plus infinity. However, if this coupling satisfies exactly the marginal constraints, as we saw in the previous slide, this is going to be always zero, no matter what the functions phi and psi are. So this is the indicator function of this set uh, p, uh, p, pi of mu and u. And so if I, this is a classic trick in, in, convex, in convex analysis, if I'm actually looking at a, a constrained optimization problem where I want this to be inside this set, it's exactly the same thing as saying that I'm going to look at any measure that is positive on omega square, but I'm going to add this indicator function here to the objective. And what, what happens then? Well, if this thing here, P, belongs to pi mu nu, then this is going to be zero. If it doesn't belong to pi mu nu, this is going to be plus infinity. So they will make this solution not very attractive, right? Because I'm looking for something that has small objective. You're basically telling me that whenever a P is not satisfying the constraint, it is carrying a price of plus infinity. So it doesn't, doesn't really count. But this is the way you can actually do duality a bit with the hands. Uh, let's take this problem. This is going to be the starting point for, 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 for duality analysis. Here's what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to write down this exactly by replacing in here the indicator function by the supremum that I just mentioned. So this is going to be the infimum of the cost against the coupling plus this thing here, and I'm just writing down the entire long line that I have. Now, because of the expression that I have in front of me, you can very easily see that I can start doing a bit of you know, changing the ordering of those expressions. The first thing is pull, I can do is just pull everyone inside the same objective here. So I'm taking an infimum over P's, over supermum over five size of this big, big chunk of expressions. And now I can try to reorganize a bit things. The first thing that is obvious is that maybe there is an expression that integrates against P here and another one here. So I might want to actually put them together. And so this is going to be done here. I'm integrating against the coupling, the cost minus phi plus psi. And then I've left apart those two integrations with respect to mu and mu of phi and psi. Now, the, the part where I'm not going to detail exactly how I can do this is the application of Sion's minimax theorem, which says that in this case, I can actually switch the order of infimum and supermum. Think that we're dealing with a linear program, so this is nothing really uh, fancy. Now, we have switched this. Once we switch here, we realize that those two terms here are not really depending on P at all. So we can do the, op the, 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 the opposite thing that we did earlier, which is essentially keep them apart and focus only on this term. And here, if you look at this expression, you have another expression that is interesting. You have another way of parameterizing a indicator function. Why is that? Well. Look at this. This is taking the smallest value for all possible measures that are positive. So this could go to plus infinity anywhere of the difference of this function and this function. So this is C of X, Y minus phi of X minus psi of Y. And what is important here to notice is that if there is any point X, Y such that C of X, Y minus phi of X minus psi of y is negative, if any of those values here are negative, then it's trivial to see that I can make this basically as small as I want by putting a huge mass on that particular point x, y. So I can make this <clears throat> diverge to minus infinity by just finding one pair x, y, such as c of x, y minus phi of x minus psi of y is negative. And so if that happens, basically I'm toast and I can Basically, this infimum is just minus infinity. However, if this is guaranteed to be always positive, not negative, I should say, that it can be zero, but at least it's going to be uh, always be bigger than zero, then there's not much room here. Because if this is all positive on, or, or, or equal to zero, if I want to bring this down as much as possible and I only have a positive measure to play with, then this means that the, the measure would be equal to zero. So this is equal to zero. So in a way, this infimum here is basically characterizing whether the cost is always bigger than phi of x plus psi of y. So if you replace this as a constraint, playing the other way around, the game the other way around, you recover the dual. So the dual of the Kantorovich primer problem in transport is just supremum over phi of a pair of functions phi and psi, such as phi of x plus psi of y is smaller than c of x, y, and you integrate phi against mu and psi against mu. Now, <clears throat> now that we've covered this, the, the primal uh, problem in, in, in the Kantorovich formulation and its dual, we can uh, start defining things. When the cost is equal to a distance to the power p, where uh, d here is any distance, it can be any metric. So recall that the only thing that I want there is that it is symmetric, it is zero if uh, x equals to y, if and only if x is, x is equal to y, and it, it satisfies the triangle inequality. Well, if the cost is a metric d to the power p, where p is more, bigger than one, okay, then you can show that the expression here, which is the optimal transport problem instantiated with the cost, which is this distance to power p, and then you take the square, uh, not the square, the p root of that quantity of this infimum, then you can show that this is actually a distance between probability distributions. 
By this, I mean that you can show that this expression here, which is often called the Wasserstein metric, is going to satisfy the triangle inequality. Okay, and very often what people play with is they get rid of this one over p exponent and put it on the left hand side to say that the Wasserstein distance, the p Wasserstein distance to the power p, is equal to this solution of a linear program. Okay. Now, <clears throat> to I'm going to play a bit more with the counter duality because uh, if you start looking at recent papers in the, in the community, you will see that the, it's increasingly exploited. And uh, notably, I mean, for, for the Wasserstein GAN paper, for instance, this is what, what people rely on, and other uh, a, a whole lot of other papers to use, use counter duality. So, what did, exactly did we gain between this formulation and this formulation? Well, it's Duality is a bit of a magic trick that sometimes provides you a different way to looking, of looking at the same problem that is, can be very convenient. And essentially what it does is it flips you know, the objective and the constraints uh, up, up and down. So essentially here we had a problem that was characterized with a variable, which is a coupling, and the constraint, uh, the, 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 the mu and the mu's play a big role here in the constraint. So the coupling is anything, but it has to satisfy some constraints that which are given to you by the input. Whereas here, the views and the news only appear in the objective. And the only thing that uh, is important here in, 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 in the constraints is the cost. So the cost and the two things that matter, again, I'm taking the, the example from the beginning, the two things that matter, the geometry of the problem and the measures are basically playing different roles. One is up there and goes down. Here it's uh, down there and it goes up in the door. So from a philosophical point of view, if you want, if you're interested in changing things about the cost, it's usually going to be the primal that is relevant for your problem. Because it's going to be somewhere in the objective and it's easier to change things in the objectives than it is to change them in the, in the constraints. Whereas if you're interested in changing the measures, new and new, then it's going to be easier to address this with the dual because if the cost here doesn't change, but only new and you change, then you're just uh, faced with changing an objective again. So this is for the, the relationship between the two. And so let me now go a bit further about tools that this kind of duality provides us with. So the first thing that you can say is that rather than optimizing over couplings, when you use the dual formulation, you're optimizing over functions. So just in terms of parameterizing things, it might be easier to uh, optimize over spaces of functions rather than couplings. Uh, and uh, I'm going to show that actually, so far I'm carrying around two, uh, to be fair, you know, with uh, each measure, one, one mu, one u, one, one uh, potential phi, one potential psi. So those functions are called potentials, so I would use the word. Uh, we can actually get down to just one. And this is uh, the meaning of counter duality. So let me just try to convince you that actually this was a bit redundant. Imagine I choose a phi function and, I, I, and I, I, I'm going to start with from phi. And you might ask, what could be a good answer to finding a good psi? Okay, so remember here we're taking a superman because this is a dual problem. So I'm going to freeze somewhat phi and ask if, if I can choose phi and fix it, uh, I'm going to consider what good candidate can I come up with for Psi? And in fact, it's very easy to, to answer that, that the, the, what, what could be the best possible match, the best possible Psi for Phi. The reason is the following. The only thing that you're looking at here is that Phi and Psi must satisfy this constraint. So for every point, pair of points X and Y, Phi of X plus Psi of Y must be smaller than the distance between X and Y to the power of P. So if you were to choose a Psi, no matter what the Psi would be, it has to satisfy this. On the other hand, what is your incentive in terms of Psi? Your incentive in terms of Psi is to make it as large as possible. Because you're taking a superman, so whenever you are going to integrate Psi against d nu, which is a positive measure here, essentially the only thing that really matters is to take as big as a Psi as you can. But this is the constraint that you have to cope with. So for every y, 
you need to ensure that for every x, this is right. So let's just put this on the right hand side. So you need to ensure that for every x and for every y, psi of y is smaller than this. So if, if, if you now want to focus on the particular y, you need that this be observed for every x. You want this to be as large as possible, but yet you can't basically, uh, uh, you can't violate this constraint. Well, this just means that the best psi you can ever consider is the infimum over all x's that are relevant here of the distance p x y minus phi of x. So this quantity is going to describe the best possible psi that you want. And uh, this is why we introduced this notation. If you give me a function, a red function phi, and I want to find out what is the best possible psi to get along with phi, then I cannot get anything better than what is called this D transform. So I'm using a red function, and I'm going to turn it into the best possible blue function to pair it with by using this transform. Okay, so it looks a bit like um, other types of transform that you're familiar with, maybe the Legendre transform, or, and you, you can actually look, see this as a generalization of the Legendre transform. Because if the distance to the power P, P is equal to two, and you consider the square Euclidean distance, actually this, this becomes the Legendre transform up to a sine flip. Now, what is what this provides us is that, well, actually, if for every function, red function, there is no better blue function that I can consider than this one, it means that when I was looking for pairs here, I could just simply actually look for a red function integrated against mu. And since I know that I can't do better than this, than this uh, as a blue function than this thing here, I can actually remove somewhat the parameterization with respect to psi and just focus on this. And so now I'm, I have a problem, which is the following. I'm just looking for the best red function, knowing that I'm going to integrate against the first measure. And when I'm going to consider the second measure, it's going to be just this, this transform. So this is what people call usually the semi-dual problem. And, uh, and it can play a role even algorithmically. Now, you might ask, why stop there? Uh, I mean, there's no reason to be unfair to the blue uh, measure. We propose this blue transform that takes a red function and turns it into a blue. We might very well do the opposite, actually. Start with a blue, fix the blue, and come up with a red function. And indeed, this is really the idea of doing the D transform, but in the other direction. We're just simply taking, given a blue function, the infimum over all y's of this thing, and this becomes a red function that, that takes as input a, a red value. Now, we can start playing, you know, by piling up red over blue over red over blue. Indeed, in the end, what I'm just saying is that if you are using this blue function, well, you might as well take the best red function that corresponds to this blue function. So take this thing here. And so what we're tempted to do is see, is there, is this useful? Can I start with a very simple red function, let's say the, the constant function to zero, and start making it to a blue function, and then a red function, and et cetera, et cetera. Apply this iteratively. Well, it turns out that this doesn't work, because you can prove that for every red function, whatever it is, uh, if you play this game twice, you're not going to get better, in the sense that you're going to get stuck in the fact that the red, the blue, red, blue transform of the blue transform of psi, of psi is the same. So this, this is a bit like taking the, you know, the Legendre transform several times. At some point, you get stuck. Now, this, however, is useful because it helps us formulate the problem in a slightly more uh, precise and, uh, and constrained setting. Remember that when I was formulating the dual problem of Kantorovich, I was basically saying, take the supermum over every pair of functions phi and psi. Here, what essentially we're saying is that we expect that the functions that would be optimal would somewhat satisfy this game that if I turn one to the other using this blue and red transforms, that I can only improve slightly my, 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 my results. And therefore, I can only get a better solution. So I might already start with functions that have satisfied this, this, uh, this game. So I'm going to say that phi is a DP concave function if there exists, if there exists a blue function such that phi is the red transform of this blue function. 
and uh, which is the same thing as saying that if I apply this thing twice, I just get the same function itself. So you might find this a bit tedious, but this is basically what is behind the Wasserstein Gantt paper. The idea is I am going to restrict myself to DP concave functions. Okay, something a blue, a red function that is already somewhat the transform of a blue somewhere out there. And I'm only going to look at the integration of phi plus the transform of phi here, uh, the blue transform of phi. And the reason why this is powerful is because if the cost function is the distance and p equals one, then there is an equivalence between saying that phi is deconcave, that is phi is, is already a good family of functions that I can consider to, to solve my problem, with saying that actually the transform, the blue transform of phi is minus itself and phi is one Lipschitz. So I'm going to skip a bit the proof. It's in this slide, so I, I invite you to just have a look if you're interested. It's, it's always good to, if you're, if you're playing with Gantz, it's always good to remember where does this Wasserstein duality come from. But the, the bottom line is essentially that if you're dealing with a cost, which is a distance and only a distance, well, taking the soup over a pair of functions is the same thing as taking a soup over one, only one function that is deconcave and doing this. And because of this result here, taking the supremum of deconcave function is the same thing as taking the supremum of one Lipschitz functions. And because this phi red blue transform is minus itself, it's the same thing as integrating phi against the mu plus minus phi against the mu. So it's, a, it's the same thing as integrating uh, this one Lipschitz function against the difference of those two densities. So this is where the, the, the Wasserstein one result comes from. Now, uh, to close a bit the, 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 the more theoretical aspects, I told you that there were links between Mosh and Kontorovich, where essentially, if you look into the math, and this is of interest for, 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 for pure mathematicians, uh, there are several results that prove that if the cost is well behaved and the measures themselves are well behaved, then first a Monge map T star must exist. So this was a bit already hinted by the Bonnier, the Bonnier theorem. And second, the optimal transportation coupling that Katorovich, uh, the Katorovich problem solves is very much related to this optimal map in the sense that the uh, coupling must be of the form, so this is a pair of function, this is the identity and T star. So this, this means that we're going to apply the identity to mu and T star to mu. And we can show that the optimal coupling is basically of this form. It basically says that uh, for every point X here uh, in, the, in the input measure, I will build a coupling by putting mass, which is basically equal to mu of X at the point X T star of X. So uh, in other words, if I go back to, sorry, this is going to be taking a little time because of all the animation. If I go back to this, this, this picture, uh, in general, when you are going to compute couplings, optimal couplings, you're going to consider a bunch of families of densities you know, very regular measures that are that are like this. But it turns out that if the input measures are actually optimal, uh, are actually well behaved, then the optimal coupling is going to be a very thin ridge over that space. It's essentially going to say, for every point x, I'm just going to uh, allocate some mass at a pair x y, which is going to be x t star of x. So this closes a bit the the, the relationship between the two. Um, sorry. So, uh, so th those are results that essentially die, date from from, uh, from about twenty to thirty years. So those are the links between the Monge and the Katowice formulation. Um, should I take the break now to take questions, or is this uh, I mean, uh, is this going to happen from the three thirty? I think I can. You unmuted us. Oh, there is one question we can ask now. But uh, should I take questions from 3.30 or should they be taking the time of the lecture or? Uh... Uh, I think the lecture is supposed to end at uh, 3.30. Okay.
but we can take so, some minutes. Yeah, okay. so so let, maybe let me just briefly go through uh, two or three slides more. Yeah. What I would like to insist is that the the distance itself is useful as a way to quantify how two measures are different. But what this will all also be useful for is whenever you have a, a metric, a distance, you can define a notion of geodesic. You, know, you can have geodesic spaces. And what this uh, entails is that you can now find an interpolation between two measures. So the, the interest of Wasserstein distance is no longer only to measure how different two measures are, but it's also a way of interpolating between them. And I will show that this is nice generalizations in, in, in a, to, to Barry centers and things like that. And to insist a bit, and this goes a bit back to the question of whether Kubak Lyra could be uh, written as, a, as an optimal trans transfer problem, um, the kind of interpolations that you get here are very, very different from the classic interpolations that you would get using uh, Euclidean interpolation. So if you have a blue measure and a red measure like this, classic interpolation is basically mixing them additively. So it would be the, the blue plus the red, and that gives you something that is somewhere in between like this. Whereas uh, optimal transport interpolation is really something that displaces mass between between the, the input and the, and the target measure. And you can see this in, 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 in 3D when you can start picturing what, what, what those optimal transport interpolation could look like. So just to note, this should work as a link in, in your PDF. So you should be able to click and, 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 and go towards that. So, uh, so this was um, the, the first point I wanted to make. And therefore, now that we're slowly moving away from the paradigm that it's optimal transport is only useful to compute distances between measures, we can now switch and go towards the next most more exciting thing, which is to use optimal transport as a loss function. So we all know that, I mean, when you square, when we compute squared uh, differences, machine learning, it, it's not so much to compute distances, but it's rather to minimize them. So this is what we do with regression and, and whatever, whatever we, uh, autoencoders, I mean, we're always minimizing squared Euclidean distances. And so that's the exciting part now in transport, which is that up to 2010, let's say most people were interested, and this goes back a bit to the question that was asked earlier, why now? Why, why, what, what is of interest right now? Well, up to 2010, most people in optimal transport and applications would try to compute the distance itself. This was an end goal. Right now, we're more interested in trying to minimize that distance with respect to a parameterized family of measures. So uh, what this means is that we will need somewhat to compute uh, some sort of gradient of the Wasserstein distance with respect to the input measures. So this is a bit of what, what, what people are excited about right now. So yes, let's take questions. So one question is, um, is whether there is connection between optimal transport and normalizing flows, if you can comment on that. Yeah, there are, of course, there are. Uh, and the, 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 basically, let's say that normalizing flows are, are a family of, um, of maps, okay? They, they're compositions that move from one measure to another. Uh, and most of the time, the, the focus is not so much on uh, actually moving from one measure to the other optimally. It's rather just getting there. So you will just try to come up with a, a sequence of small operations that you can easily differentiate through that get you where you want. So in that sense, this is more about transporting stuff. It's, it's a nice parametric family of transports. When you throw in optimal transport, then you're basically trying to do this efficiently. And uh, there, there are a few papers that, that, have, that, that are trying to, uh, to, to throw in that optimality by basically adding some regularization to, to your uh, normalizing flow optimization. So I've seen a paper recently called Trajectory Net uh, that, is, that is to appear at ICML that does that. And they, they use this in, in the framework or in the context of, of biology. Thank you. Uh, Pierre has asked, can be optimal transport related to compression? Yes. Well, yes. Well, there is a very deep link between, for instance, k-means and optimal transport. Essentially what k-means is doing is whenever you have a measure, which is data in, in, in L2, okay, in, in, in Euclidean space, trying to come up with a k centroid, that is a measure with less points, k points, instead of maybe 1 million points, just 100, 
that satisfies the k-means problem is actually a, an optimal transport problem. You're just minimizing the Wasserstein distance among all measures that are supported on k atoms between your input measure, the data measure, and those k atoms. So there, there are links, of course. Yes. It's, it, it more generally, it's links with quantization, to be a bit more precise. Okay, thank you. Uh, Christian has asked, uh, assume I want to move densities on the Riemannian manifold. Would it be sufficient um, to just use the distance on the manifold as cost, or is there more to do? Or is there more to do? No, actually, the most, well, the, the, there is a lot of work in the theory on, on, on doing optimal transport manifolds, Riemannian manifolds, and this is basically work from the 2000s. And so the generalization of Grenier theorem to that setting is, has been done by McCann and others. And uh, so, no, no, indeed, uh, I mean, and even in the applied world, it's very common to do optimal transport on, 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 on meshes, for instance, or graphs. And this is behind a lot of, uh, so, some of the nice applications in graphics, for instance. So if you think about the brain, for instance, the brain is a, is a, is a manifold and you have, you have signals and you can compute basically transport between signals in different areas of the brain. And typically you would use the shortest path distance on that manifold. And so there's, there's some nice work. Uh, one of my students, Isham Janati, has been doing some nice, very nice work on that. Um, so Hugo has asked um, that in practical situation, it is common to have more soldiers than barracks. Is there a natural extension to deal with yes. that? Yes. Yeah, that's a very exciting question. Uh, this is really a short uh, lecture, so I, I, I can't get into all the details, but indeed, the, my main message is, okay, Monge provided a transport uh, optimization problem, Kantorovich defined another. Uh, now, as we all know, uh, nothing is sacred. Uh, whether it is in the objective or the constraints, you can start changing whatever you want. And uh, then the only thing is whether this is interesting. And there are unbalanced transport formulations that exist. And they've been around for the last, let's say, it's work that dates to, to early 2000s by Ben Amu, but, but the, the very nice and exciting developments I think have happened in the last five years or so. And so the, the, there are interesting unbalanced transport formulations. Yes, thank you. So is there any more questions from the audience? Please raise your hand if you have questions. Okay, apparently we don't have more questions. So thanks everyone for joining us for this session. Thanks Marco for the great lecture. And so we will have a, a round table uh, in 30 minutes in, in another session. So feel free to join and thanks, thanks all. Yeah. Thank you. I said, see you tomorrow lecture. Uh, it was a nice lecture though. So is the, the, it's closed? Oh, I said, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I said like, see you in, in tomorrow's lecture. It was a very nice lecture. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.